you know, there's this real satisfaction, isn't there? Setting up a Proxmox home lab, getting your VMs humming, containers spinning up. It feels like you've got this super efficient server right there. But then sometimes that excitement, it kind of turns into the sinking feeling when you check your SSD's wear out percentage and you see those numbers just, well, climbing faster than you'd like. We've definitely seen the posts, the chatter in online tech communities, people talking about drives hitting crazy levels, like, what was it, 195% wear out with only 20 terabytes written? Yeah, or consumer drives just burning out in months. It's a real thing people are running into. So it really makes you ask, and this is our question for this deep dive, why? Why does Proxmox seem to chew through SSDs faster than you'd expect? And crucially, what can you actually do about it to make those drives last? Right. That's exactly what we're digging into today. We want to unpack the reasons, the technical bits behind this common headache, and then more importantly, lay out a set of um, really effective tweaks and optimizations, stuff that gets you that SSD victory over premature wear out. And this isn't just theory, you know, it's based on hard earned wisdom, real experiences from home labbers, plus uh, a bit of technical know how sprinkled in. Okay. So our goal is pretty clear then. Transform your Proxmox setup. Take it from being a potential drive destroyer to being a lean, mean virtualization machine. And hopefully save your SSDs and yeah, your wallet too. Definitely save the wallet. <laughs> so Proxmox. We know it's super popular in the home lab world. Open source, robust, handles VMs, LXCs, ZFS storage. It's fantastic. But like we said, this dark side is that it can chew through SSDs incredibly fast. It's a frequent complaint, but what's actually happening under the hood? Yeah, you, you've nailed the core issue. What a lot of folks discover, maybe the hard way, is it often boils down to Proxmox's default setup. And honestly, it's love for logging. Like one user put it really simply, Proxmox can eat through drives very fast. It logs a lot. Simple as that almost. It logs a lot. Okay. But it's a bit more than just logging. If you look at ZFS, which so many people use in Proxmox for its data safety features, well, it uses copy on write, which means even tiny changes don't just overwrite old data they often write completely new blocks. This causes something called write amplification. You end up writing more data physically to the SSD than the logical change you made. And ZFS, um, it has quite high write amplification on default settings. Right, so default ZFS settings plus lots of small changes equals lots of writes. Exactly. Now, picture combining that ZFS behavior with workloads that are constantly hitting the drives with small frequent writes. Think databases, maybe certain active VMs. That combination is just brutal on typical consumer SSDs, the ones most home libraries start with. They just don't have the high terabytes written or TBW ratings that enterprise drives do. And that's where we see those scary examples, right? The cheap 128 GB drive hitting 195% wear out after only 20 TB. Precisely. Or that 240 GB drive reaching 90% wear in under a year. It happens. So the big question becomes, how do we dial this back? How do we manage this? Okay, so it's not just complaining online. People are actually sharing solutions that work, these battle-tested fixes. Let's unpack those. What are some of the first things people try? Well, the first sort of immediate step is quieting down Proxmox's background chatter. Background chatter, meaning services that are just running and writing data unnecessarily. You got it. A lot of services enabled by default in Proxmox are really meant for clustered environments or specific use cases. They might not be needed at all for a single node home lab. And these services, they generate background writes. It might seem small, but over time it adds up, especially if you're running ZFS underneath. Mm. So the community advice is pretty direct. If Node is not clustered, turn off cluster services and core sync. Makes sense, right? Yeah, if you're not clustering, why run the clustering service? Exactly. And similarly, if firewalls is not used, turn off firewall service. These are simple toggles, but they cut down that background noise significantly. Okay, that makes sense. What about swap? I've seen people say disabling swap is like an instant win for saving your SSD. Is it that simple? It can be a really big win, yeah. Swap rights can absolutely hammer SSDs, mm -hmm. especially if your system is maybe a bit low on RAM and starts swapping aggressively, constantly moving data back and forth between RAM and your SSD. Yeah. So the general advice is either turn off swap completely if you have enough RAM, or at least reduce swappiness parameter, make it so swap is only used as a, you know, absolute last resort. But there's a catch with ZFS here too, isn't there? Ah, uh, yes, a crucial warning. Whatever you do, avoid putting your swap partition or swap file on a ZFS file system. Why is that? Because ZFS's copy on write will kick in for every single swap write operation, massively amplifying the amount of data actually written to the SSD. It makes it a bad situation much, much worse for drive endurance. 
If you need swap, look at alternatives. Maybe a RAM disk if you have tons of RAM to spare. Or better yet, put it on a separate dedicated drive that isn't formatted with ZFS. Mm. Maybe an old spinning disk or a cheap separate SSD just for swap. Wow. Okay. So turning off a few services, managing swap correctly. Yeah. These sound like pretty straightforward changes, but they actually make a real difference. They reduce that constant trickle of rights eroding your drive's life. They really do add up. Yeah. It's about reducing that unnecessary wear day in, day out. You mentioned Proxmox's logging being uh, prolific earlier. I've heard some pretty wild numbers thrown around, like how much data it writes just from logging by default. What are we really talking about here? Is it significant? Oh, it's significant. Yeah. Very significant. One user did some tracking and estimated the default Proxmox setup was writing something like 60 gigabytes of data to disk every single day. 60 gigs daily. Wow. Yeah. And a huge portion of that is just logs. System logs, VM logs, Proxmox's own internal activity logs. It's constant. For consumer SSD, that level of rights is, well, it's practically a death sentence over time. Okay, so that's a huge problem. What's the fix? The elegant solution, and one lots of people recommend, is moving those logs off your precious SSD entirely and putting them into RAM instead, using a RAM disk. There are tools specifically for this, like Log2RAM. The advice is literally move logs to RAM using, for example, log2ram. That sets up a RAM disk and redirects log writes there. And that stops the writes hitting the SSD? Mostly, yes. Yeah. You can also take it a step further. Configure Journaled, which is the system's main logging service. Tell it to write directly to 2Fs. That's a temporary file system that lives entirely in RAM. Doing this drastically reduces the IOPS, the input-output operations per second hitting your physical drive. Keeps all that transient log chatter off the SSD. The benefits sound huge. You're drastically cutting down on write operations, extending SSD life. Probably improves performance a bit too, right? Less sure. disk activity. Absolutely. Less disk contention means potentially better performance overall. It's a win-win for drive health and responsiveness. But there has to be a trade-off. If the logs are in RAM, what happens if the server reboots? or crashes. That's the trade-off, you're right. Logs stored in RAM are volatile, they disappear on reboot. So you lose your recent logs in that case. How do people deal with that risk? It's a risk most home libraries seem willing to accept to save their drives. But it absolutely means you need a plan B. The community emphasis was crystal clear on this. Make backups and disaster recovery plans for the worst case. You simply cannot skip having good backups, especially when you start messing with where fundamental things like logs are stored. If something goes wrong, you need that safety net. Makes sense. You gain drive life, but you need that backup discipline. Okay, let's talk ZFS again. We know it's powerful, but that right amplification is the challenge for SSDs. What optimizations can ZFS users actually apply? Right, for ZFS users, there's actually a whole bunch of knobs you can tune. It's a bit of a, a treasure trove of optimizations if you dig in. But it's all about tailoring it to your specific workload. Okay, like what? First off, block size. You really should optimize ZFS block size depending what type of data resides on it. Yeah. So if you're storing large media files, big sequential stuff, maybe a larger block size like 1 mb is better. It reduces metadata overhead, makes things more efficient. But for VMs. Ah, for VMs, which tend to do more random reads and writes of smaller chunks of data, a smaller block size, maybe 128 KAB, it's often recommended. It helps avoid writing huge blocks for small changes, reducing that write amplification. But the key thing here is it really needs testing for your own use case. You might need to benchmark your specific VMs to find the sweet spot. Maybe databases need something even smaller. Okay, so tune the block size. What else? Second, turn off a time. That's the access time timestamp that gets updated every time a file is read. Turning off a time will lower the writes to metadata. It might seem tiny, but over millions of file accesses, it adds up. Less metadata writing means less wear. Got it. A time off. What's next? Third, tweak your IRC size. That's the ZFS read cache and RAM, the adaptive replacement cache. You need to optimize RC size for your use case. Too little or too much is not good. If it's too small, ZFS might constantly be flushing cache and hitting the disk. If it's too large, it might starve your actual VMs of much-needed RAM. So you need to monitor it, maybe using ArcStat, look at your hit ratios, and find that balance for your system load and RAM amount. Finding the sweet spot for the RC. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? One more. Prefetch. ZFS tries to predict what data you'll need next and read it into the ARC ahead of time. But if your workload is very random, like some VMs can be, Prefetch might not be helping much and just causing extra reads. Check your ARC stats again. If the prefetch efficiency is low, you might consider turning it off. But again, this highly depends on use case, so test carefully. Don't just blindly turn things off. Right. 
test, test, test. I've heard people say doing these ZFS tweaks really helped them. Someone specifically mentioned, I've done this for my personal Proxmox setup to save some wear on consumer drives, so it seems to work in practice. That's the kind of feedback we look for, yeah. Real world results. And, you know, if ZFS features aren't absolutely essential for you, maybe you have amazing backups or the data isn't critical, there's the alternative. You could just use ext4 as your file system for VMs. Generally, it has lower write amplification than ZFS out of the box. But there's a trade-off there too, right? Less yeah. data protection. Exactly. You use ext4 at the cost of your data having less protection. No checksumming, no built-in snapshots in the same way. So it prompts that question for you, the listener. Is that lower risk acceptable for your data in exchange for potentially longer SSD life? You really have to weigh those risks and rewards based on your setup and backup plan. Okay, so we've covered software tweaks, but the hardware itself matters hugely too. It's crucial to remember that not all SSDs are created equal, especially in a demanding Proxmox environment. We hear about people getting burned by cheap, low TBW drives. Why is that such a pitfall? It's absolutely critical because, generally speaking, usually the cheaper the drive, the lower the TBW. Ugh. The manufacturer just hasn't built it or warranted it for as many writes. And the underlying flash technology matters too. Going with QLC drives also increases wear faster. QLC, that's quad-level cell flash, stores more bits per memory cell. Which sounds good, more density. It is for density and cost, but it makes each cell less durable. It takes more precise voltage levels, wears out faster with repeated writes, compared to, say, TLC, triple-level cell, or older MLC, multi-level cell, flash. So what's the recommendation then? Avoid cheap QLC. For a Proxmox boot drive or VM storage drive that sees a lot of writes, Yes, generally avoid cheap QLC if you can. What's emerged as a really strong recommendation from the community is using used enterprise SSDs. Drives like the Intel S4500 series, for example. People are finding these are a game changer. Used enterprise drives, are they reliable? They often are. They were built for much heavier workloads initially. We saw that user experience. Someone burned through a cheap 240 GB drive quickly, switched to used Intel S4500s, and saw we were climbing at less than 1% per month or so. That's a huge difference. It just highlights that enterprise flash is way better than consumer flash. It costs more new, obviously, but buying used enterprise gear can be a very smart, cost-effective move here. Okay, but what if you want to stick with new consumer NVO drives? Any advice there? If you're going consumer NVMe, the advice is simple. Go big. Get a larger capacity drive than you think you might need. Why bigger? Because generally, the smaller the drive, the lower the TBW. A doubling in capacity generally means a doubling the lifetime in terms of writes. Larger drives have more flash chips to spread the writes across, and manufacturers usually give them proportionally higher endurance ratings. We saw an example. Someone reported their 1TB Samsung 970 EVO showed only 1% wear out after three years running Proxmox. That's pretty good for a consumer drive in this scenario. Bigger capacity help there. That's actually quite reassuring, you know, this idea that the wear-out percentage hitting 100% isn't necessarily the immediate death of the drive. Yeah, that's a really important point to understand. That percentage you see in smart data, the percent is advisory. It's primarily based on the manufacturer's estimate for warranty purposes. Mm. It doesn't actually result in failure at 100%. So the drive doesn't just automatically brick itself at 101%? Not at all. We see tons of anecdotes from the community. People running drives perfectly fine at 240% wear, or drives rated for, say, 50 TBW that have handled over 300 TBW, like that one person. My 500 GB Samsung 840 Pro has a TBW of 50. I'm on over 300 TBW and over 55K hours power on. So far, not even an error. These drives can often go way beyond their ratings. Okay, but you can't just ignore it completely, can you? I mean, seeing 240% wear, most people would be in panic mode by then and replace the drive with garbage. Absolutely. You shouldn't get complacent. That's why consistent monitoring is so critical. The key advice is monitor smart data regularly and track wear out trends over time. Don't just look at the number today. Track the number over a few months or so and see if it changes. Is it stable? Is it creeping up slowly? How do you know if the trend is bad? Well, if your wear percentage goes from, say, 73% to 74% over six months, you're probably fine. You've got years left at that rate. But if you see it climbing 1% a day, like that user who had a misconfigured DHT indexer hammering their drive, yeah, yeah, that's an alarm bell. Time to investigate and probably replace it soon. So monitor the trend and have a plan. Definitely. Have mitigation strategies ready. Keep spare drives on hand if you can. Consider running RAID configurations like RAID 1 mirroring for your boot drive. Yeah. That way the system can keep operational while exchanging disks that really broke down. 
Mm -hmm. But the absolute non-negotiable foundation under all of this, stressed by literally everyone commenting on this topic, is backups. Backups are non-negotiable, period. Backups, 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 got it. Stepping back a bit, it's fascinating to see how Proxmox has really surged in popularity, especially with all of the changes in the virtualization world, like the great VMware exodus people talk about. It really has shifted the home lab landscape. And it's interesting because if you look at its origins, Proxmox always has been targeted as an enterprise solution yeah. designed to run on proper enterprise hardware, ideally in clusters. But home labbers adopted it anyway. Exactly. That classic home labber DIY spirit just embraced it. People started running it on everything from refurbished PCs to old laptop drives, whatever they could get their hands on. And you see that sentiment reflected, like the person who said, tinkering with it was really educational and I don't regret the time spent on it. It became a learning platform too. And it's that tinkering, that widespread adoption on non-enterprise gear that seems to have uncovered this whole treasure trove of tweaks to make it work well, even on consumer hardware, especially regarding SSD wear. Precisely. This whole experience has really driven home the point that SSD endurance is heavily workload dependent. Things like databases and intense logging are just notorious for accelerating wear. But these strategic tweaks we've discussed can massively mitigate that uh -huh. and aligns with what storage vendors like Intel tell us too. They rate their enterprise SSDs from maybe up to 10 drive writes per day, or DWPD. 10 times the drive's capacity written every day. Wow. Yeah, build for punishment. Compare that to typical consumer drives rated at maybe 0.3 to 0.5 DWPD. It's a huge difference in built-in endurance. Which loops back to why those used enterprise drives can be such a good value for Proxmox. Exactly. They're just built for the kind of sustained writes Proxmox can generate, especially with defaults or demanding workloads. Okay, so let's quickly recap the path to SSD victory in Proxbox. It's about uh, disabling services you don't need, moving those chatty logs to RAM, carefully optimizing ZFS if you use it, Choosing the right kind of SSD for the job. Whether that's enterprise or just a larger consumer drive. Right. And finally, keeping a close eye on that wear percentage over time, monitoring the trend, and always, always having backups. And these tweaks, remember, they're largely crowdsourced. They come from passionate online communities figuring this stuff out together. It's really a testament to the ingenuity you find in the home lab world. So thinking about your own setup, maybe your next upgrade, or just managing what you have now, what does this all mean for you? Hopefully it means you don't have to be scared of Proxmox eating your SSDs. We really encourage you, dive in, experiment with these tweaks, find what works for your specific setup, and enjoy having a Proxmox system that's both incredibly powerful and sustainable for your hardware. Yeah, do it right, and your SSDs and definitely your wallet will thank you in the long run.